Okay, hi everyone, this is Katie Schultz. I'm here with Matt Gallagher today for our Putting It Into Practice interview for the blog, and I'm so excited to talk to Matt. He was kind enough to send me his book before it came out, um, and I had to wait to read it because I was working on my own. So this is the advanced copy. You can see the real one right behind Matt. Um, and he's gonna spend a few minutes with us today to fill us in on his process and whatever else we end up touching on. So thank you for joining us, Matt. Of course, Katie. Thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to this. So tell us where you are. I'm in my apartment in Brooklyn, New York. It's uh, 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 very hot here. So the, uh, uh, the AC has been blaring all day. I'm, I'm not looking forward to the electric bill, but it's, it, it'll be worth it. Right. <laughs> well, the first question um, is pretty straightforward, but I haven't found an answer to this online yet, so I'm actually really excited to hear you tell us about what inspired Youngblood, which is a work of fiction, and your first book was inspired from your blog, which is, of course, nonfiction. Right, yeah, so I go back in time to fall of 2011, uh, and I'd uh, gone back to graduate school uh, uh, for creative writing, I, I wanted to get better at fiction. Um, I, I'd already written some uh, nonfiction and published Kaboom, which was my memoir, but uh, uh, I wanted to get better at fiction and I always kind of been a classroom learner. I'd also sworn off war literature, or, or so I thought I, I was doing. I was writing about anything and everything that didn't ha uh, had in anything and everything not to do with Iraq or the military or, or the war. I was just very cognizant of not being a, a quote unquote war writer. Uh, of course, this is the same time frame though that. Uh, the American military was was withdrawing from Iraq, and uh, you know I'd spent 15 formative months uh, in that country uh, as a as a young army officer. Uh, so I think for some very obvious reasons, you know I was staying up late watching the news, uh, just kind of seeing what what was happening. You know uh, these questions of of legacy and an inheritance and, and how the uh, uh, how the war had played out, and, and you know mm -hmm. thinking about um, you know all my friends, American and, and Iraqi. Uh, who had who'd, uh, given so much uh, uh, over there? Some uh, some some had given their lives. Um, you know, kind of all the all these all the big questions were really swirling through my head. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, five years later, we kind of have some answers uh, to that. But you know, at the time, you know, we really didn't know how the war was going to turn out. So you know, I, I kind of made a bargain with myself, and I was like, okay, you know, uh, I'm, I'm really drawn to this. Obviously, you know, maybe you can do one short story. And that'll be it. Uh, and, it and it has to be uh, set before you were there, right? To get some kind of cognitive distance uh, from it all. So that initial short story was, is, was kind of the backstory for what eventually became Youngblood. Uh, so, you know, set in 2006 during the height of the sectarian wars, uh, about two years before I was there during the surge. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the best laid plans of, of Mice and Men, of course, that 30-page that short story became a 300-page novel. Uh, but it, that uh, that's kind of how it all, all started. I really had to kind of negotiate with myself initially. Mm -hmm. Wow. Awesome. I, um, I'm still sort of resentful that I had to write a novel. <laughs> I'm sure someday I'll be really grateful, but I'm curious if, like, uh, if you had any a similar emotional response once you realized that, you know, the beast you'd created was going to become a monster. You know, uh, you don't know what you don't know. Uh, so I think in that way, I was maybe uh, 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 a little bit ignorant. Um, so I was like, okay, I'll, uh, I'll write a novel. You know, uh, looking back on it, I, uh, I don't know if it would have helped had I really known what I was getting myself into. Um, you know, kind of a big part of the process was realizing, you know, uh, I ended up kind of setting the novel during, during that withdrawal time frame, like 2011. So a couple of years after I was there, I didn't realize until I was kind of knee deep in it all how much uh, research I was going to have to do and how mm -hmm. much uh, uh, I was going to have to kind of get away from my own my own memories and, and my own skull uh, uh, as I was putting together this story in this world uh, uh, because the war had changed so much in, in those three years mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know I think like a lot of writers I'm, I'm a writer I, I write to figure out more exactly. How I feel about something, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I eventually got there uh, uh, through multiple drafts with Young Blood, kind of, kind of answering uh, some of those big questions that I'd posed earlier for myself. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but to your point, it, it took much longer than I think I'd originally 
uh, anticipated it taking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we never know where the imagination is going to take us. Um, so you and I have crossed paths uh, a couple times. I think the first was in New York for Words After War panel. Yes. At least in person. And then um, then you came to Interlochen, a place very near and dear to my heart, and you taught there. Yes, that was a lovely um, summer. Oh my gosh, yeah. It's a great place. Um, I'm really curious about what you've learned, maybe something surprising um, about the war literature community of writers and readers. Now you're two books into this. You are fully identified as a warlet author, although I, sure. I'm sure that your followers will read um, whatever you write next, regardless of whether it's about war. I'm looking forward to it, certainly. But what's been striking to you about this community, something you might not have thought would have proven true? I, I am con- continually inspired and motivated by, by the community and, and, and how... Um, uh, supportive and, and legitimately supportive uh, uh, we are with each other um, and how excited we get w- with one another's successes mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and how motivating we are um, uh, when, uh, uh, when maybe things aren't going, going quite right uh, uh, for some of us. It, uh, uh, you know, the writing world kind of is filled with um, uh, uh, maybe people play, play acting at that, but there's a real substance I found kind of in the war writing community of people really, really um, just being excited uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, by one another's, another's work and one another's successes. And I, you know, I think, um, and this is, uh, uh, you know, this is anecdotal, but I think a lot of this is, you know, it was only a couple years ago, you know, as, as this community was kind of forming, um, there was a real question of whether anybody would read these stories, right? Whether mm-hmm. anybody would care about fiction from Iraq or Afghanistan or, uh, or, 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 or what have you. Um, uh, uh, we knew that nonfiction or a certain type of nonfiction, the kind of the very rah rah heroic patriotic story, mm-hmm. um, uh, had, was finding a readership. But you know, I think good war literature is more skeptical than that, right? And, and it's, it's certainly going to be more ambiguous uh, and, and and operate kind of in the the dirty uh, dirty gray crevices that that make up everyday life. Mm-hmm. So I think that kind of that sense of camaraderie and, and, and uh, uh, one for all spirit uh, uh, that for the most part has really maintained itself through these through these years kind of goes all back to that because it was just kind of a reckless thing we were we were all doing together which was well let's write about this we we care about it and and uh, hopefully we think we think readers will care about it too but we really didn't know mm-hmm. uh, so you know whether it's uh, um, you know you, you have. Uh, ben Fountain, uh, a wildly successful author of, of Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk, you know, I, I've just met him a couple times, and he is, uh, 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 you know, he's as famous and, and made made an author as there is. And he's he's as supportive and, and champion of this kind of emerging, uh, diversifying community as, as anybody, and, mm-hmm. and he's just one example of of many many people. Uh, so That's uh, awesome, yeah, and it's 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 the more uh, I. Th- I the more into the writing world I get and interact with kind of different parts of it, the more I realize just how rare that is and, mm-hmm. and how special our, our community really is. Yeah. Cool. Well, I feel the same way. <laughs> it's well put. Well, you're, you're a very prominent member of it. so uh, it's, been, it's been lovely to be welcomed. You, I agree completely. It's a really supportive. Yeah. And um, it's, you know, uh, I think, it, you know, Veteran or civilian, uh, uh, men, men or women, uh, 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 a v- wide variety of, of maybe messages or themes kind of being conveyed in these works. Uh, that's okay. Uh, we, I think we all want that. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, something I know we've talked about before is, is how vital it is to have uh, uh, prominent, uh, uh, good civilian writers of civilian backgrounds, such as yourself, writing about these wars, right? Mm-hmm. Because not just because, uh, um, uh, they matter, and, and it, it's a way to get people thinking about these wars on a citizenship level. But just, you know, strictly from a literature perspective, oftentimes the best war literature um, uh, is produced by by writers with maybe a step back and some perspective. Uh, right. Stephen Crane and the mm-hmm. Red Bad Courage is a very mm-hmm. famous example of that. So uh, yeah, it's been it's been a really kind of motivating thing uh, uh, to see happen, and I say that both as a as a veteran, but, uh, and also as a writer. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. One of the best, um, 
answers that I ever heard actually was at AWP. I was on a panel with um, a handful of other Warlet authors and we were talking about research and Phil Clay, author of Redeployment, um, said that one of the things he researched the most was simply the power of a well-written sentence. So, you know, and that's, that was true for everyone on that panel, which happened to be about Orlid, but it's true for every one of us who's a writer as sure. well. So I really loved that. Right. Um, it's, it's about the work more than anything else. I know, thank goodness. <laughs> right, thank right. Goodness. So one of the things I love to ask everyone that I interview for this series is to share a tiny moment. And um, for my listeners or viewers, a tiny moment is like a flash fiction or a flash nonfiction in this case, since we're hoping you'll tell us a true story. So something from your life or experience, um, mundane or otherwise, where you were really struck by a, a distinct change. There was the way you saw the world before and the way you saw it after. Is there anything that jumps out? Yeah, you know, I, uh, I think the first thing that comes to mind is, is something I really wanted to convey in Young Blood. It was kind of the, vin the uh, visceral effect uh, uh, that I, that Iraq had can have on a person, right? The, 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 mm -hmm. uh, specifically with the senses. Um, uh, you know, one moment that, that really lingers with me, this is early 2008. We got called to, uh, investigate a, a potential, uh, I think it was a potential roadside bomb is it was called in from a helicopter pilot. Well, it turned out to be kind of the middle of, middle of a garbage dump, um, off the, off the, off a major highway North of Baghdad. Mm -hmm. and uh, um, uh, people were living there. They were religious exiles that uh, had been forced out of regular communities, and, and uh, um, uh, they, you know, it was called Trash Village. And uh, uh, just, there was so much going on in that moment, um, and uh, uh, the smell of that moment, the, 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 the various tangs of not just the garbage dump, but the nearby kind of sludge from the, uh, uh the slow moving mud river, um, the dust in the air being kicked up from the, from the helicopter that it, that it called in the report. Um, the, the weird sense uh, one of my soldiers started handing out beanie babies to the kids, to these, these poor, I mean, poor, poorer than any kind of poor that, that we deal with in America. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and uh, uh, the, the foreignness of that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, there was just so much going on. I mean, we could not have been, could not have been there longer than 10, 15 minutes. Um, uh, but there was so much going on. And, and, and you know, that's a moment among many that I've returned to over and over again uh, in, in my writing in terms of just trying to capture the, the surrealness mm -hmm. of it all, but also kind of the visceral effect of, of of these tiny, you know, it was a, nothing happened really, right? We mm -hmm. just went to place, everything was fine, and then we left. You know, it wasn't a big gunfight. There was no big explosion or anything. It wasn't a big meeting with an, a big powerful person or a big powerful general. Um, but that moment, uh, uh, more than anything, uh, sticks with me. And, and you know, I, I don't think I've figured out exactly why yet. So I mm -hmm. think that's why I keep returning to it in my writing in, in, in various ways. Um, you know, maybe, maybe it's just maybe taking for, for a scene that has nothing to do with that, taking that sense of smell or, or taking the, taking that visual image of the, the dust rising from the helicopter. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that, mm. uh, that day, uh, is something I return to a whole lot. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That, well, it makes a lot of sense to me, too, in having read your book. I think I emailed you when I was just at, like, chapter five, and, you know, the sensory detail was just, it just blew me away. It was so, you know, I've been reading about and researching war for six years and trying to pull that off in my own work, and, and then when I read it in Youngblood, I was like, okay, this is it. And I'm more, I'm there more now than I, you know, have ever felt in six years of living with the material, so. Thank you, um, I appreciate that. Yeah, it was great. It was just really powerful and um, brought it to me in new ways, uh, which is really important for me to never feel like I'm getting too familiar with the material either. But that image of the, the Beanie Babies, you know, 
one reason maybe it has stayed with you so much is the, as you said, the surrealness of it, but maybe even more to the point, like, um, of all the things to give a child living off of a dump. But of course that was what he had to give. Right. Um, but, but, but it, I can see how it's so just that image of a hand and a beanie baby, how that just kind of says it all. Yeah. And it, I mean, the kid's reaction was very different than, um, uh, you know, Iraqi kids that we, we'd encountered before because he had this, this young child had no context for what this was. He just kind of stared at it. Yeah. Right. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but to your point, yeah. I mean, that's what, that, that young soldier had to give in that moment. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I want to ask you about a book recommendation for our last question, but I'm going to sneak one in before okay. that. Um, another thing um, that I was really struck by with Young Blood were these sort of hard truths that you would land on in between the descriptions and the action and um, the backstory about, well, the many narratives that threads that you have going on um, in the book. But uh, several that I just wrote down, for example, were um, they made me miss home without reminding me of it. So that's the um, main character, the protagonist speaking about something he's encountered. Or another one was everything was either or, either or. Um, so there are these little jabs of these totally hard things <laughs> that the speaker can't, the narrator can't do anything about. Um, when you were writing those, were you, when you landed on them, were you aware that, that you had found something really true, that you had written your way up to this thing of like, okay, this is going to help bridge the gap. This is going to bring my readers in. Was there any sense of that or even later in revision um, or um, is that only something that's coming out now maybe as people are reviewing your book and celebrating it as you do your tour? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think a little bit of both. You know, something that mattered to me as I was writing it and revising it was um, uh, conveying kind of, uh, uh, in a, kind of the vast diorama of of industrial war, right? And uh, a, a, a cast of characters who have very small uh, parts in it, but it is their everything, right? It is their entirety, whether it's the, the protagonist, J Lieutenant Jack Porter, or, uh, uh, or Rana, the local Iraqi sheikh's daughter, or, or even the quote unquote antagonist, uh, 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 Sergeant Daniel Chambers, who I, grew, I, who I grew to admire greatly uh, mm -hmm. as, I wrote, as I wrote him. Um, I mean, say what you will about the man, but but he got things done, right? And, and the world needs people like that. Uh, so you know, kind of conveying those those uh, uh, those lines and maybe some others, uh, uh, I think was an inevitable result of that uh, of of taking kind of uh, seeing the friction of of somebody's entirety and somebody's goals. All, all three of those characters and, and others, you know, they all want to kind of find one noble thing. Mm -hmm. in the, of, in the midst of a, a, a war and a world of, of deep un, un, injustice and unjustness. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the things they all land on come into friction uh, with one another. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and the, uh, uh, you know, in that way, I think um, I, I was hoping to convey kind of a microcosm of uh, 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 maybe not uh, all, all warfare, but, but at least kind of contemporary, um, uh, these, these kind of contemporary mm -hmm. savage wars of, of peace and, and, and uh, perhaps maybe even the, the nine year war and occupation in Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so in that way, yeah, I, I think maybe it was uh, a bit intentional. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, once it's out there, uh, 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 you know, a reader is interacting with your text and bringing an entirely different perspective and worldview and set of experiences to it. And I can't tell you how many times, and I, I'm sure you've had this experience with, with flashes of war, um, when, when readers get something very smart and powerful out of, out of a scene or out of a moment or out of a character that mm -hmm. um, uh, they describe so eloquently and beautifully, but you really didn't intend for that. But it sounds so, it, it, you can tell that it's resonated with them so powerfully and it, it sounds so right. Uh, you know, I, I can't say, oh, uh, 
they, they, I mean, they got it right, right? It was right for them yeah. in, in that reading. Um, it, it wasn't a wrong reading or a, or a misinterpretation or anything, but uh, it's, it may not have been a, a, a totally conscious decision on, on the author's part. Um, I, you know, I think that's one of the coolest and also scariest parts of, of being our, an author is, is uh, having readers interact with your text uh, 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 so deeply that way mm -hmm. um, and getting things from it that maybe you didn't even intend. Um, yeah. That's great. I, um, I love that, that they're all trying to find one noble thing. That's so, that could be a tagline. <laughs> They don't yeah. need subtitle. They don't always need subtitles and uh, for a novel, but um, yeah, I think that really. Thank you for that. That really helps summarize it because it is quite complex. You take on so much uh, and you do it really well, but but that's a really powerful thread. Um, so I always like to end these interviews by celebrating someone else's work, um, and I would love to know. It could be something you're reading now or have recently read or really from any time, um, but something that, you know, a book that rocked your world and why. Let's give a, let's end with a shout out. Sure, sure. Well, I'll give one uh, kind of classic shout out and then one, one contemporary okay. shout out if that's okay. My, yeah. my classic is uh, that I uh, uh, ask all my students to read um, uh, pretty much whatever course I'm teaching uh, is Pale Horse, Pale Rider by mm -hmm. Catherine Ann Porter. Uh, it's either a long short story or a novella, uh, depending on how you, how you classify it. But it's, uh, it's a story about, nominally about uh, the influenza outbreak in Denver, Colorado uh, uh, during World War I. But it's really about kind of the, uh, uh, the underlying uh, text there is uh, trench warfare in World War I. And in addition to just being a beautifully uh, rot story uh, filled with uh, uh, full dimensional characters, um, uh, you know, trying to make the best they can uh, in, in, in kind of a world gone mad. Uh, to me, it's it's the perfect example of of how war writing can be tackled by anyone mm -hmm. from a variety of ways. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Catherine Ann Porter didn't serve uh, in the military in France, uh, but she was a citizen. She was an American citizen who gave a damn. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 these ideas and topics uh, mattered to her and she found a, a, a brilliant way uh, 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 to write about it uh, about uh, nominally about the home front right mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's well worth any in any reader's time uh, I think it's maybe 50 60 pages something like that the title one more time pale horse pale rider pale horse pale rider. yeah okay. and the author the author's name is is uh, Catherine Ann Porter yeah uh, and then a contemporary recommendation, uh, you know, gosh, there's so, there's really just a lot, a lot of good, um, good works uh, that have come out recently. Um, but I, I'll have to kind of give a, uh, give a shout out to, uh, uh, to my, to our friend, Brian Kastner, mm -hmm. um, uh, his, his most recent nonfiction book, All the Ways We Kill and Die. Uh, which is uh, one of the most thorough, uh, well-researched, engaging um, uh, looks at uh, 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 bombs and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the people who make them uh, for the quote-unquote enemy. And then the, the people, uh, uh, you know, kind of on, on the American forces and the coalition forces, uh, like Brian used to be, who, who were uh, trying to re literally reverse engineer this, right? Mm -hmm. And kind of track these um, uh, 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 those folks down using, uh, uh using technology. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, Brian's storytelling is, 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 is so, so powerful. And it, you know, it's, um, it's just kind of this beautiful blend of, uh, of, uh, journalism and creative nonfiction mm -hmm. that, that really kind of brought me back to, uh, uh, kind of the new journalism heyday. I mean, it's, 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 it's the kind of work that Joan Didion, Michael Hare, yeah. uh, Norman Mailer would be, would be proud of. So, uh, uh, you know, I had about 10 different books pop into my head, uh, hmm. uh, uh, but uh, I'll go with Brian's all the way, uh, Brian Kastner's all the ways uh, uh, we kill and die. Yeah, it, you can't go wrong with that. I agree. <laughs> well, um, you have a couple websites. So what's the best one right now? For uh, us my author, my author website um, with kind of info on events and uh, uh, info on the book is just mattgallagherauthor.com. Okay. I'm also uh, on Twitter at uh, uh, Matt Gallagher Zero, 
And uh, you can also find me on Facebook. Yeah, good. I'll put those links up with the interview. Here is the book one more time. Can't go wrong. And thank you so much for your time, Matt. Oh, my stay pleasure, cool. Katie. Stay cool in New York. <laughs> Appreciate it. Take care. Mm -hmm.